Dublins have won at Croke Park. Ireland crestfallen. Well, we'll depart Croke Park with some magnificent memories. At Croke Park, a glorious chapter in the history of Irish sport came to an end. All the while, a blank page was being prepared across town. It bears no resemblance to what stood before. The Aviva Stadium is complete. And yet the memories of the old place still echo from these transparent, shimmering new walls. Lansdowne Road was a quirky sort of stadium. It had a train line going through it and a station. I don't particularly do nostalgia very well, I have to be honest. But I have some wonderful memories from the place. It's like getting married, it's like seeing your first child the first time you go to, uh, to Lansdowne Road. The Spanish used to come over here and start, and seriously, they would start laughing at the pitch. I didn't think it was a funny pitch. It's almost been like watching a, a child grow up, and it's, it's, it's almost, almost to full adulthood. I've seen nothing of it, obviously seen the plans. It's a shame, really, I don't like change. As much as it, you know you've got to move with the times, it is sad. It's sad, especially when you played there and you've been a big part of it. You know, it was 12 years. This place was, you know, part of my career. Was that it there? Looks like a greenhouse. Wow, that's special, isn't it? It is impressive, isn't it? That is impressive. I, I never really thought it'd be like that. I didn't think it would be pay specs. But I'm, I'm really impressed. That's magnificent. It's the, it's the first time I've seen the, the finished stadium. It's, uh, it's hard to come up out of nowhere. We, we don't get up from Cork to Dublin that often, so this thing has appeared overnight, but it, it really is spectacular. I remember that famous day we played Australia for the, in the World Cup quarter-final. Nick Barr-Jones' wife had arrived, I think, the day before. And she came in before the match looking for the creche facilities for her babies. So uh, you could imagine in those days, we were lucky to have showers and toilets. Obviously Lansdowne, you know, people described it as a bit of a kip, to be fair. <laughs> um, but it was home, wasn't it? Here's Keith. Right, Keith! The players' lounge was a hut in the corner of the ground. You know, I had friends playing for England, you know, Jamie Dernap and Steve McManaman and Robbie Fowler. And like they couldn't believe it. They were like, no, you, you can't be, your players' lounge can't be some hut. And we were like, yeah, honestly, it's a hut. But um, it's them little things that make it special. When it's empty, it was a terrible place. I mean, you know, it was a barren uh, concrete structure. But the difference was Lansdowne Road was transformed on the day of a match. Mullins going to score. Try! There it is on the pin to walk. It's been an extraordinary journey, I suppose, over seven years. But it seems like yesterday when we went in for the demolition day. And Croke Park was grand. It was great to, to, that we didn't have to go abroad. But it really was only a stepping stone back to the stadium that we were building with the RFU. I think what has happened here is that we've arrived at the right destination, but probably by the wrong route. We go back to 1999 and the idea of Aircon Park, a new home for Irish football, was being floated. Soon afterwards, you had the Bertie Bowl, and neither ended up happening. So I think in, in every sense, it, 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 this is the ideal solution, and, and not least because, albeit that this stadium is clearly unrecognisable as what we used to know as Lansdowne Road, and yet there is this historical continuity because it's on the same site. 
At a cost of over 400 million euro, the Aviva Stadium has taken four years to complete. It involved the labor of 6,000 people with 1,300 construction workers on site at the height of the building phase. The stadium's vital statistics are staggering. Covering over 6.4 hectares, it contains 185 kilometers of cable, 5,000 tons of steel, 35,000 cubic meters of concrete, and 72 kilometers of pipe. From dust to this, the vision of a new home for Irish rugby and soccer has been brought to life. The doors are open to new fans and old friends. This is my first view of this, Ken. What about you? Oh, I haven't been here. I haven't been here since the uh, ground closed. Now, Jack, could you, could you drop a goal over there, do you think? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> this is really quite something, isn't it? It's marvellous. Yeah. And when you think, uh, you know, in the early days, can you remember they used to erect special forms along the touchline, and you could buy a touchline seat, touch and it seat. was actually on the touchline. Yes. They're only a few feet away from the touchline, actually on the grass verge. I mean, I don't know what you were like over 100 yards, but over 20 yards, over 25 mm. yards, he had that burst of speed that nobody could, could stay with. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? The ball goes to Captain Jack Kyle, who tries to break through England's defence. If a girl is going to be a model, she's got to be a certain height, certain looks and certain figure. You know, she has those basic assets. And I think a lot of us who achieved anything in the field of sport had basic assets that we just had to put into operation, as it were. I keep quoting, there's a wonderful French phrase by a man called La Rochefoucauld who says, La nature fait le mérite, la fortune le met en oeuvre. Nature gives the ability and chance calls it into play. And there it is, England and Ireland draw with nine points each. Uh, it was going out on the pitch, it was, it was the noise out there on Lansdowne Road, walking up the, I can hardly call it a tunnel really, but up the steps and out onto the pitch. It was just a wonderful experience every time I did it. There's something here, but there's going to be a yellow card for Mick McCarthy. There's many comments passed about it being a rugby field, and you could see the teams come out, have a look, and start having a look round. And... and of course it got better, didn't it, when Jack turned up and we started having a bit of success. The crowds were, were bigger, better, noisier, the whole experience just being in Ireland for the few days it was just brilliant. And now Brady again. Yes! A lot of people dismiss the sort of ole ole brigade and all that. There's a slight snobbishness now. But it was fantastic to have uh, those days that seem to have all taken place in sunny afternoons when the old place was thronged um, and Ireland were winning. Still Houghton, men in the middle, Whelan's there! You can argue about the quality of the football, but at the time, success was unfolding before people's eyes in the stadium. Stolten's cross! I've always lived in the shadow of Lansdowne Road. As a kid, it was our playground. We, we went in there and played our own World Cups and our own Triple Crowns on the back pitches. The original brainchild of, of uh, the Lansdowne Road Stadium was a man called Henry Dunlop, who was a race walker himself, and he wanted to set up a new athletics club. It was it used for all sorts of strange things over the centuries. There was uh, baseball, lacrosse. There was a Russian Cossacks exhibition team came here in 1924, standing on horses and doing headstands on horses and mad stuff. Lansdowne Road was completely levelled to clear a site for the Aviva Stadium, but one piece of the old stadium was spared from the wrecking ball. When World War I broke out, um, the, the president of the IRFU, a man called Frank Browning, he decided to set up what was known as a PALS regiment. They mustered in Lanzar Road. So from Lanzar Road, they moved to the Curra and then on to Gallipoli. 
there were nine rugby internationals who died in the First World War. And it's nice, it's nice that there is a fitting memorial to them in the stadium at the time and that it's going to be incorporated into the new stadium. Scotland comes to Dublin as at Lansdowne Road, the men of Ireland are prepared to do battle with the Scots. The capacity crowd that packs the historic Dublin venue almost raises the roof of the stand. To George Best, will he try and take on the fullback? Look at the cheek of this man. I've driven past it any number of times and it's almost been like watching a, a child grow up and it's, it's, it's almost to full adulthood uh, now. This is really absolutely spectacular and breathtaking. Ollie Campbell, his 15th cap today. Looks a good kick. It had been 33 years since Ireland had won a Triple Crown, since 1949. And amazingly, it was actually the first uh, Triple Crown that was actually won here in Lansdowne Road. And he says it all, doesn't he? The crowd just literally willed us to victory. The whistle is gone. Ireland have won the Triple Crown after 33 years. 22 caps, is what, which, which is what I got, and only been 10 times here, which by today's standards is relatively very few. So with my tongue in my cheek, definitely, uh, what I say to people, I, I went for quality rather than quantity. England were a big, strong, physical side and, and came back into the game. Spillane gathers. Brian Spillane won a great ball off the line out. I just took it on. This is Lennon, bursting into the 22. Rob Andrew just managed to get my boot laces at the time, the first tackle he ever made in international rugby, somebody claimed. Back to Bradley. He got it and it went into folklore and uh, delivered a, a second Triple Crown and Championship in three years. And quite honestly, words fail me just in a moment. Sit back and enjoy it. For me, there is only one field of dreams. Uh, and this is it. Still the hollow ground and will always be. From little kicks to big ones, Aviva are looking out for you. For you. It looks amazing, a special top class stadium. That'll, uh, you know, be exciting to go back there again. A lot of lads hadn't played or in the squad and haven't played in Lansdowne Road, so um, to go back there now, it'll be like going back home really for, for Irish football. Playing San Marino, you know, you're expected to win. You know, I got my first goal yet, and a little bit of pressure builds to get your first international goal. And, um, you know, it was uh, a night game, which is always a bit extra special. You know, it was a cross from Kevin Kilban. Got a nice header on it in off the crossbar. Oh, the chat's there! And that's it for Kevin Doyle. To the goal. It was just a relief to get my first goal for Ireland and the joy of it and uh, you know, it was a great experience to have pictures of it up at home. Very high in that box again, swung in by Duff Doyle! Nice to get my, my goal there as well in Crow Park, um, another header. And poached his second international goal. Crow Park is you know, so big that you sort of nearly lose some of the atmosphere with, with, with the sort of pitch being that bit smaller on it. It needs to be a really big game for the atmosphere to be good, you know, but again the excitement rises again for us now because we're going back to, to Lansdowne to the Aviva. From the beginning of the new development, accommodation has been an issue. Crow Park hosted crowds of 80,000 plus for rugby and soccer, but 80,000 into 50,000 just doesn't go. Selling out every game in Croke Park is, 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 is a tall order, actually. Uh, a lot of our clubs have been struggling in trying to take up the, the number of tickets that they're required to take up. I, I think re the reality is, for most of our fixtures, this stadium will be more than enough. 
I think when you look at a stadium for 50,000 people, you've got to look at the fact that there's going to be lean years as well as bountiful years. And uh, it's all very well to think of the bountiful years and think, oh, this place is not going to be big enough. Sadly, there'll be times when they'll probably struggle to fill this. And that's the reality. And I think 50 is a pretty happy medium. It was really strange about um, late last year, I was walking down just near Oxford Street in the West End and this fellow yelled at me from across the road and I thought, oh God, you know, who's, who's this guy wanting to annoy me? And it, it, running across to me, it was Gordon. Inside oh! nose, Hamilton! Gordon Hamilton is going for the lead! It's in across, Hamilton is in! It was in October last year, so it was pretty close to the date that we actually played against one another in the 91 uh, World Cup quarterfinal. Little and Campisi's in again. That quarter-final against Australia in 91, without question, the most disappointing I've ever felt after an international game. And Curtis to Staples, and Staples kicks, and Clark's after this. The Gordon game. Hamilton try came out of nowhere. There's Gordon Hamilton sprinting away from 50 yards out, outpacing Campisi and Rob Edgerton, our other winger, for a wonderful try and a pitch invasion with all these mad Irish people <laughs> celebrating. The most phenomenal scenes at Lansdowne Road. Michael Liner famously said behind the goals there was three things that had to happen uh, and they would score a try. Slattery back to Liner. Liner now to Horan. Horan to Roebuck. Roebuck and now Campisi. And Campisi, Mullen puts him down. Liner picks it up. Liner's in. Dived over in the corner with to much, uh, much relief and uh, once again a very, very eerie silence in the stadium. It has to be one of the great occasions of Irish sport. The sadness only is it wasn't marked by an Irish victory. Yeah, I met Michael Liner recently. He was a bashing fella, but uh, I never forgive him for what, he for what he engineered that day. Oh my God. I quite like the stadium that I played in as well, but I mean, nothing like this. I've never played nothing like this in my life. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. The atmosphere with the fans was the closeness that you had with them. You know what I mean? You had a laugh, even when we're warming up and stuff like that. You had a, you had a warmth about you that, that someone would call you and you'd actually know them. And you'd be going, oh, geez, how are you, Jack? When you're in that dressing room and you're actually pulling on a green jersey, it's the best feeling in the world. For me, it was the best feeling in the world anyway. And you look around at your teammates, you know, the likes of Mark Lawrence and Ray Houghton, Mick McCarthy, and Liam Brady, who was my hero, literally my hero. Now it's Brady. Oh, beautifully played, he's in. Yes, Brady. Of course, one has to congratulate the Irish Rugby Union that when the country was divided, they said rugby is not going to be divided. It used to be, Ken, oh, we don't have any unionist politicians down here. Nice of you to come. Some people say, well, you stand for the, for the soldier song. It's the national anthem. I wouldn't find it strange. I wouldn't find it compromising my views. The one thing that I find when I come back to the rugby fraternity is the inclusiveness. The final had been billed as an event that transcended Ireland's political and sporting divides and at the final whistle a huge cheer went up all over the island. It was truly a famous victory. Ulster's victory may have marked a joyous occasion. But over the years, Lansdowne Road played host to other matches that were shadowed by conflict. Tensions were high when the all-white Springboks toured in 1970. Anti-apartheid protesters clashed with Gardaí outside the stadium. In the end, the game passed off with little trouble. That could not be said 25 years later when the English soccer team came to town. So you saw the timber going down as well. There were stones, there were coins. It was a very nasty and dangerous situation. There was, there was an awareness of a kind of hardcore of 
of English support in the upper west here, down from where we, we were sitting in the press box. Well, there's trouble in the crowd. The referee has stopped the game. Clearly, yes, the security could have been a whole lot better. The fact that they were put in the upper tier, I mean, you wouldn't need to be a kind of military historian to know that the last thing you do is give people the higher ground, you know, because you're, you're looking for trouble. It was kind of unique that that stuff did not happen in Lansdowne Road. And I suppose the biggest consequence of it was, was as simple as this, that we haven't played England since. The visit of England's rugby team in 1973 generated a much different feeling. While Wales and Scotland had refused to travel the year before because of the troubles, England arrived to play despite threats from paramilitaries. I did have one Corby to the house before I went, yes. Just uh, watch out, basically. So, But, uh, you know, it could have been anyone. It might have been a reserve hooker <laughs> trying to get my place. <laughs> England ran onto the field to a standing ovation, led by Irish Premier Jack Lynch. It didn't really register with me, to be perfectly honest. It obviously was a great ovation, but, uh, you know, I was just uh, a bit worried. I didn't want to get on with it and get it over with. And it's a try. Another penalty kick by McGann sends the score to 18 for Ireland, England 9. A great day for the Irish. The, the dinner, you always got to say a few words after, and. I don't know, it just uh, came to me, I suppose. I said, you know, we might not be the best team in the world, but at least we turn up, which to me seemed the obvious thing to say. That day uh, just transcended rugby, transcended sport. I think the English should never be forgotten for that, and I don't think ever will be. This is going to be a truly terrific home for our Irish national rugby and soccer teams. Aviva Investments in the naming rights of, of, of Aviva Stadium has been a, a, a critical element uh, of the financing of the stadium and we've been delighted to have the opportunity to support the FAI and the IRFU. It's going to be hard for old stagers, of which sadly I now have to include myself, to start referring to this place as the Aviva Stadium rather than Lansdowne Road. But uh, I, I had a, an interesting little experience coming in on the dart one day not so long ago. A whole bunch of little schoolboys got on from a local school. The teacher said, we're going to be uh, coming to the new stadium now. And to my astonishment, they began chanting spontaneously. I don't, I don't think there was anyone from Aviva, as a marketing department around to encourage them. They began spontaneously chanting Aviva, Aviva and I thought, the battle is lost, you know what I mean? And I'd also remind myself and remind anyone, it could be worse, there was a time when the League of Ireland was known as Pat Grace's famous Fried Chicken League. So I think people might be able to live with the Aviva Stadium. It's still a stadium on Lansdowne Road, and I think that's important. And uh, ultimately what it's called doesn't really matter. You know, what gives a stadium life is what happens on the pitch. Irish I think myself and the players that were involved then might all have the same memory of, of Lansdowne Road probably being the best occasion. And Roy Keane with the first big tackle. And I remember Roy nailing somebody in a tackle that kind of set the tone of the game, as he did. Terrific player that he was. Helping it on towards I think if we're all telling the truth, when it came to him, we're all, you know, not expecting him to do that. It was just a fabulous finish. And a little cross in there, and it's come through here. Back it's here! Kind of landed perfect. It kind of sat up perfect for me to it on the R folly. And um, I remember running away with this like real sense of adrenaline come over me and stuff, not really knowing what, how to celebrate. I just remember it just being electric and then being out of breath. We kicked off and I couldn't breathe. Lansdowne must have had half a million people in the ground that day because I've met every, everyone I've met was at that game. This was the cup final and Jason McAteer has won it for the 10 men of Ireland. Obviously to play in uh, the last international in Lansdowne Road was, was just a really special moment, you know. And this is Irish International Rugby saying goodbye to the oldest international stadium in the world. It was great, you know, because the crowd stayed around for a long time afterwards and we kind of did a lap of honour and it was, it was a really special moment and uh, one I really treasure. 
I think we're going to get a really, a really good, uh, good kind of amount of noise here. You know, I think it's going to become one, hopefully one of the um, one of the special, really special places to play in terms of atmosphere. It's great that they built a new stadium on the, on the old grounds because it's such a special venue. I think everyone's really looking forward to, to getting back here and, and hopefully doing the place justice. Aircom Park, the Bertie Bowl, Rule 42. Controversy, debate, dispute, all silent now. The transition is complete. I love it and I think it's going to be great for Irish soccer and it's going to be great for Irish rugby and we're all going to have hopefully a lot of success here. In every respect, we've got our home back. Yeah. Magnificent though it is at yeah. the moment. It'll be a new stadium and after a couple of games we'll be all used to it and it'll be, it'll be like home again. This is going to be an iconic structure worldwide. It'll be instantly recognisable and something I think that everybody in sport in Ireland can be incredibly proud of. From lift to the stadium, to lifting the roof off it, Aviva are looking out for you. The Mole digs up some fresh insights on Flash Forward starting on Too Soon. It's not always easy knowing what's around the corner, but with Aviva, there's always someone looking out for you. From making sure your home is protected, to providing access to the best health care for you and your family. From getting you on the road, to pensions and investments for your future. So whatever's around the next corner, we are too. Aviva, looking out for you.